An unprecedented fire season is underway in California, destroying homes and livelihoods and polluting our air on top of a deadly pandemic and devastating economic crisis. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Javi Hernandez Ayala, he, him pronouns, a founding professor of the Geography, Environment and Planning Program at Sonoma State University. He is the current director of the Climate Research Center at SSU and also researches the intersections of colonialism, imperialism and capitalism with climate change in the global south. Tonight, he will be speaking with us about the local conditions leading to and created by the wildfires and how this is a climate change issue. Please welcome Dr. Hernandez Ayala. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Yale for that wonderful uh, introduction. I'm more than honored to be participating today in this uh, very important discussion and panel, right, that we're gonna be um, going over some very, uh, I wanna say important issues and trying to identify those issues and also later on provide some uh, solutions um, like I, I'm, I'm a geographer, climatologist, right? My research focuses on understanding the relationship between climate change and extreme weather events like extreme precipitation floods uh, and droughts. Uh, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from Puerto Rico, born and raised. I'm currently in Puerto Rico because I had to, you know, like uh, move over here because of, of the difficulties that we were facing in California with the pandemic and the economic crisis and you know, uh, my wife losing her job. And today I wanna to go over how climate change is really exacerbating a lot of those um, natural processes that do occur uh, in our state. But what climate change is doing is really accelerating and is, is making those um, extreme events like the wildfires, like heat waves more frequent and of higher magnitude. Right, but first of all, I wanted to start with kind of a, a defining what climate change is, because even within a very progressive movement like the PSL, we might have some, um, I want to say, um, misconceptions about what climate change is. And some people tend to confuse this, this, this term with climate variability, right? So we know that climate, you know, naturally varies uh, over time, you know, or, you know, different earth cycles, of the earth's orbit, right? But what we, what we kind of define as climate change are those changes in the normal conditions, right? That are identified by, you know, actually, um, you know, evidence that we see out there, right? Are we seeing that over time, you know, different places are experiencing higher temperatures? Are we seeing that our oceans are getting warmer and this is leading to uh, higher evaporation rates, more energy that then produces, you know, more powerful storms, right? Like Hurricane Laura that came uh, and impacted the state of Louisiana, right, uh, this week. And how this season, for example, in the Atlantic Ocean, we have seen you know, record breaking number of storms because of how much heat that the planet has accumulated. So climate change uh, and human induced climate change, right? Uh, because we have, you know, natural forces that cause climate change like the Earth's orbit, plate tectonics, but those forces takes hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, but our human actions actually take uh, way less time than that. So we're talking about since the industrial revolution, Right, we are seeing a rapid change in the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that are trapping then all that energy that leaves our planet and is, is warming up our planet. But the warming is just, you know, the the one of the of the factors, right? Then there's this domino effect that this warming causes. And in the case of California in particular, uh, we have that California is one of those places on earth uh, in which climate change is hitting the state from all angles, right? So uh, in Sonoma County and in the Bay Area, right, we're seeing uh, more, I wanna say, you know, higher frequency of higher temperature days, you know, like heat waves, you know, super extreme, you know, like temperature days. I remember when I moved to Sonoma State after living in Puerto Rico, living in Ohio, living in Texas, it was the first time that I actually saw 
a, a thermometer, you know, like me sitting next to a thermometer that went over 110 degrees. And that this was right before uh, the wildfires of 2017. And so those geophysical processes that do occur, like wildfires, is making them more extreme because it's, it's making them happen earlier, you know, in the season like we're seeing this year, right? Uh, this year we're seeing fires, you know, like happen throughout the entire state of California and we're, we're still in August and we're not yet on, on peak season when we see the Santa Ana winds and the Diablo winds picking up later uh, in the fall, like late September or early October, right? So these are all indicators, right? That, you know, the changes that we're seeing in, in our atmosphere, in our earth system are not necessarily being driven by natural forces alone. They're also driven mostly in terms of, of kind of the more recent, um, you know, like phenomena that we're seeing mostly driven by uh, human activities and our dependence on, you know, fossil fuels and, you know, really our expansion into that, you know, like wildlands. The, the scientists call this like the urban wildland interface. And we're getting closer and closer and closer uh, to those uh, areas that were not necessarily, um, I want to say, as impacted by humans. And this is making the situation uh, even worse. Right, but in the, in, you know, a lot of attention is given to wildfires, but there are also other risks associated uh, with climate change. Because with climate change, what we're seeing in different locations is that you know is exacerbating the extremes. Right, so places that are you know let's say very very wet, you know, during their raining seasons are experiencing even more rainfall. And places that usually are super dry during their they're kind of a, their drought seasons are even are getting drier. And that's what we're seeing in the Caribbean. That's what we're seeing in different areas of the world. And that's what some scientists are finding out also in the West Coast and in, in, in California in particular. We're seeing, you know, wetter winters followed by super dry summers, which create the conditions, right, for wildfires to, uh, you know, like develop earlier and also increase in their magnitude in the areas that they then uh, impact, right? But other impacts that we're uh, gonna see, right? And that we're actually seeing is, you know, sea level rise, coastal erosion in many of our coast, many of our counties in the Bay Area that are already experiencing those effects, right? We're gonna see, you know, changes in the water cycle we're going to see changes in the snowpack in the Sierra, and we're we're seeing those changes right now. With you know, over the years, we see less and less snowpack accumulation, right? because instead of getting most of the precipitation in the form of snow, we're getting a good chunk of that precipitation in the form of liquid, right? Precipitation, and that causes other changes in terms of the water resources, which then has you know a domino effect on you know the. Uh, agricultural activities in the Central Valley and other activities dependent on that water, you know, in areas uh, around the state. And so what we see in California is really a combination of, you know, multiple um, climate change exacerbated um, processes that if are not addressed, properly addressed, and right, are going to really have even a major impact, you know, a larger impact than the one that they having today on, you know, many communities uh, across the state. And, and the science is clear, right? Even if we stop all of our emissions, even if we transition to 100% renewable, even if we, you know, go 100% sustainable agroecology, the planet is going to keep reacting because of all of the things that we previously did over, you know, the previous decades, right, and, and, and centuries that led to this moment. So the question is, and this is what, you know, the other speakers are going to be addressing, is what are, you know, the real solutions, right, that uh, we have as a society, as a global society, to address these problems, right? Do we, um, you know, keep, you know, the system that, you know, allowed 
uh, you know, the balance of, of, of our climate system to be disrupted, right? The same system that believes in eternal economic growth that we can take and take and exploit from our planet without our planet reacting, right? Or do we find, do we realize that, you know, we can't really, you know, like, you know, stop all of the things that are going to happen. We can, we might have, we might be able to minimize the worst impacts, but at the same time, we can plan, right, and make sure that even in that more extreme world that we're living, right, what we have in mind is the, you know, the, 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 the health, right, of, and, uh, and happiness of all of those human beings who are going to be living in this extreme world, right, and that all of those necessities are satisfied. Right? And, and that takes uh, a lot of effort because climate change at the end of the day uh, is, 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 is a problem that was created right, by, you know, certain, uh, you know, like, um, I want to say, uh, actors, which influence right the way that you know most people think, and those ideas that took us here—the ideas of eternal economic growth, and you know seeing the planet as a pool of resources to be eternally exploited—is what got us is, is what got us here. And the only way that we can get out of that that vicious cycle if, is if we go and attack those um, those philosophies and those. Um, you know, like, um, I want to say theories that allowed us to um, get to this stage, right? So, um, I can continue to talk, but I want to, you know, uh, keep it to 10 minutes, and I want to allow then uh, the other speakers to uh, continue the discussion on the topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Javi. We're so honored to have um, you as the professor here with us tonight and, you know, teaching us that these wildfires are, you know, they, they are a consequence of climate change and understanding what that means. You know, as a teacher myself, um, being here, I'm just, you know, the catastrophe of these wildfires are very raw and they're very real. And, we, and I see it in my students' families. So we definitely need to figure out what is going on and attack the problem at its roots, as Dr. Javi was asking us to do. So we'll have time for questions and comments after all the speakers have presented, but people are welcome to type their thoughts into the chat at any point during the program. Our second speaker tonight is Tina Landis. Tina Landis uses she, her pronouns and works in air quality and climate protection and holds a certificate in sustainable management from UC Berkeley. She is an organizer with the PSL and author of the most recent PSL publication, Climate Solutions Beyond Capitalism. And I have it right here. I highly recommend it. <laughs> she will be presenting on the climate crisis we find ourselves in and the global response. So we're currently at a fork in the road. One path leads to the extinction of our species and the second to an evolutionary leap forward for humanity. The time for debate and piecemeal solutions is long past. Every year is getting warmer with 2020 on track to be the hottest on record and the decade of the 2010s was by far the hottest decade. Ice sheets are melting, sea level is rising, deserts are expanding and extreme weather and wildfires are increasing. The unstable atmospheric conditions that caused the dry lightning that sparked the current wave of wildfires will become more frequent as climate change unfolds. The mainstream media would have you believe that there's nothing you can do other than buy more so-called green products and electric vehicles, that we have to put our hopes in the wealthy entrepreneurs to come up with some magical tech solution to save us all. The ruling class is concerned with finding ways to profit off the catastrophe rather than saving humanity. Their narrative omits any real solutions because those solutions challenge the capitalist system itself. Today in the US, the government leaves us all to fend for ourselves, while tens of millions have lost their jobs and health care and are facing eviction. And on top of that, thousands have now been displaced by the fires in the Bay Area. All this during a pandemic. The responsibility for such hardships is always an individual one. It's a personal failing if you're laid off or get evicted. But more and more people are seeing through this lie. It's the system that does little to nothing to actually help people in any meaningful way when catastrophe strikes. 
It's the system that instead of providing homes for those who lost them in the fires, instead of providing a guaranteed income for those laid off, instead of providing universal health care for everyone, they instead spend trillions to bail out the banks and big corporations and nearly a trillion more on the war machine in the middle of a pandemic. I want to give an example of how the capitalists see climate solutions. The recent Twitter post by Tesla's Elon Musk bragging about the U.S.-supported coup in Bolivia, which happens to have large lithium reserves used in electric vehicle batteries, truly encapsulates the ruling class attitude. Touted as an entrepreneur leading the way toward a sustainable future, Elon Musk is in reality just another opportunist parasite getting rich off the climate crisis. A recent study out of Cambridge showed that replacing all of the UK vehicle fleet with electric vehicles would require an immense increase in raw material extraction from the global south, which is one reason Bolivia was targeted for regime change. Just replacing the UK fleet alone, not any other country, would mean twice the annual global production of cobalt, three quarters of the world's production of lithium, nearly the entire world production of neodymium, and more than half the world's production of copper. This shows that we can't just green capitalism and continue on as always. We must reduce our footprint globally and change how we live and get around. Selling more electric vehicles is not the way out of the crisis, but rather a continuation of imperialist plunder and exploitation. The UN climate summits from the first in Rio in 1992 through today have never set binding emission reduction commitments. And in fact, the US has fought against any proposals for binding targets. The much touted Paris Agreement's voluntary commitments have us on target for three degrees Celsius warming when scientists warn that, warn that staying below 1.5 degrees warming is what is needed to avert catastrophe. Mass protests have been held calling out these summits for what they truly are, a greenwashing campaign by the wealthy nations to continue business as usual. The crisis, the crisis can never be overcome if the wealthier nations continue imperialist policies of domination and divisiveness but instead requires a global coordinated effort based on cooperation and sharing of resources. The wealthier countries must contribute much more to these efforts since they hold the more responsibility for the problem and must pay reparations for their centuries of plunder of the global South. Capitalism always seeks ways to maximize profits by producing goods in the cheapest way possible. It must constantly expand markets and increase production regardless of whether or not there is any real benefit to society. Post-World War II, the US ruling class pushed the consumer culture that we see today. This saw the birth of advertising and planned obsolescence where things are purposely not made to last so you're forced to regularly buy new products. Part of the advent of marketing also pushed car culture and the house in the suburbs greatly contributing to environmental degradation through increased vehicle emissions and destruction of ecosystems. The same period also birthed the so-called green revolution in agriculture, which brought the reliance of chemical methods to food growing, which has poisoned the ecosystem and people alike and has degraded soil and water resources. There are three major steps we must take to stem the looming crisis. Eliminate fossil fuel use, reduce our carbon footprint, and restore ecosystems to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. The Biden campaign's so-called climate plan is mainly a handout to nuclear and carbon capture industries, and he has vowed to continue destructive natural gas extraction. His campaign originally had promised to cut subsidies to fossil fuel co corporations, but that language disappeared from their platform at the convention. We have the technology to immediately shift to wind, water, and solar energy production and still meet the world's needs. But neither the Democrats or the Republicans have any desire to disrupt business as usual, which a complete shift to renewables would require. Solar and microwind are allowing communities around the globe that have never had electrification to leapfrog over fossil fuels directly to renewables. In 2014, Bangladesh installed 3 million solar home systems as part of a government program to achieve universal electrical access by 2021. China has by far the largest annual investments in renewables than any country. 
contributing $100 billion domestically and $32 billion internationally. Despite China's immense economic growth between 1980 and 2010, they achieved a 70% decline in energy intensity. And their 13th five-year plan that began in 2016 set the goal of further reductions by 15%. The nuclear and fossil fuel industries and big utility companies act as a barrier to renewable implementation. Touted as a low carbon form of energy, nuclear is lumped in with renewables, ignoring the life cycle carbon, life cycle carbon emissions and the high risk of catastrophic reactor failure and the unresolved problem of waste. This powerful lobby successfully diverts subsidies that are meant to fund true renewables to nuclear instead. The US always points the finger at China as, as a big polluter, but in reality, the US has the highest per capita emissions on the planet, with China coming in 10th. Additionally, emissions from the US war machine are never taken into account despite that the Pentagon is the largest unregulated polluter and consumer of fossil fuels on the planet. The entire system of capitalist production is unsustainable. Since globalization arose in the early 90s, emissions just from shipping raw materials and finished products back and forth across the globe accounted for a 400% increase in emissions. Production needs to, greatly, to be greatly curbed to reduce energy needs and the immense amount of waste and pollution it creates. Things must be made to last using the most sustainable low carbon methods. We need to eliminate waste like single use items and produce what we can locally to avoid energy needed for shipping. We can keep up the current level of production and maintain a livable planet even with renewables. If everyone on the planet had the carbon footprint of people in the US, we would need five planets to sustain us. We must also strengthen and restore the natural carbon capture mechanisms of the planet, from the forests to the grasslands to wetlands and oceans. Because we're at such a dire tipping point, we must go beyond sustainability to regenerative practices, meaning practices that help to heal the ecosystem not just maintain it. Industrial agriculture is a huge drain on the ecosystem. A shift to regenerative agriculture practices, also known as natural farming, produces equal to greater amounts of food than industrial methods, and at the same time restores soil nutrients, increases water tables, cools the air temperature, and increases biodiversity. Organic farming, while better than using industrial chemicals, doesn't go far enough and still requires fertilizer and irrigation and lacks the capacity to build soil. Natural farming combines trees, legumes, vegetables, and ground cover together in a plot. It requires no irrigation, fertilizer, or plowing of soil. This is important because tilling soil releases stored carbon into the atmosphere and destroys the underground fungal network that aids in carbon capture and build soil and build soil. Natural farming can even restore desert lands into thriving ecosystems. These methods have been systematized and can be replicated in any part of the world, regardless of soil quality and climate by incorporating native species. Farmers in the Sahel region of Burkina Faso have seen water tables increase by at least five meters over the last few decades due to natural farming techniques. I learned an interesting fact recently when studying natural farming regarding California's dry climate. In the 1700s, the Spanish colonizers brought oat and rye grasses, which wiped out the native perennial grasses of California. The native grasses had very long roots, which could access water reserves year round, meaning they stayed green during dry season. Natural farming pioneer Masanobu Fukuoka advised massive aerial seeding of California to restore the native grasses, which would greatly reduce wildfire risk and cool the climate. The myth that we cannot feed the world's population without chemicals and GMOs is just a big, just a cover by a big agribusiness to control the market and reap massive profits. In fact, 35 to 50% of food produced in the US is wasted. Food scarcity is an issue of access and distribution, not productive capacity. 
Industrial practices for raising livestock is what causes the increased methane emissions from farming. Animals are fed a diet that is hard to digest, and the manure is collected in giant ponds that release methane into the atmosphere. These practices are the source of the problem. Although as a culture, we do need to greatly reduce meat consumption, returning to natural grazing methods would greatly curb the impact of livestock on the ecosystem. Agroforestry allows livestock to graze in forested areas, fertilizing the soil with their droppings as they roam and providing forage that is easier for them to digest, greatly lowering methane emissions. Oceans are the largest carbon capture mechanism on the planet and are responsible for much of our oxygen. Seven out of every 10 breaths that you take can be attributed to the aquatic life support system. Today, marine life is in decline due to overfishing and warming ocean temperatures. The oversaturation of carbon in the oceans is causing acidification, triggering deficiencies in exoskeleton formation in shellfish and corals. Coral reefs provide 70% of protein to island nations and are under threat from rising temperatures. Projects around the globe are attempting to restore damaged reefs and protect them from bleaching, with research being done on heat-resistant algae and super corals that survive higher water temperatures. Marine permaculture projects are working to return ocean deserts to thriving habitats by restoring the natural upwellings which provide food for marine life. Sea level rise is a looming catastrophe that will affect more than a billion people globally. In 2019, Greenland saw record ice loss with, over, with the other four record years occurring within the last decade. The Greenland ice sheet alone could cause a 23 foot sea level rise. And this is not accounting for the melting ice sheets in Antarctica. Natural solutions like restoring reef systems, marshlands, mangroves, and seagrass beds can serve to absorb rising seas, protect coasts from storms, and increase carbon capture mechanisms at the same time. Vulnerable populations must be moved away from low-lying areas, but governments are more concerned with maintaining property values and their tax base than taking action to protect people in advance of the crisis. To cool the climate, we must lower emissions and also restore the natural carbon capture mechanisms of the planet. A project in Siberia called Pleistocene Park is reintroducing large herds to the region, which has been found to help prevent permafrost melt due to their grazing activity. Another study has shown that reforesting only previously forested lands on five continents could capture two thirds of all the carbon emitted since the Industrial Revolution. China's Great Green Wall project to stem desertification has planted more than 66 billion trees across 13 provinces in the country's north since the program began in 1978. Another Great Green Wall project is being implemented across Africa to stem the spread of the Sahara. Leading mycologist Paul Stamets research on mycelium for ecological recovery shows great promise. He discovered that mushrooms can remove toxins from soil and water at a much lower cost in a much, and in a much shorter time frame than traditional bioremediation methods, and restore toxic land to thriving ecosystems within weeks. There are also mushroom spores that act as natural pesticides on carpenter ants and malaria carrying mosquitoes. Another type of spore helps honeybees recover from the virus that is decimating hives globally. Mushrooms can also serve as a fast-growing compostable replacement for styrofoam. All these natural ecological-based projects are sorely underfunded and underreported, despite their great potential, because they can't be sold for a profit and don't require long timelines to achieve results. Capitalists prefer to build carbon capture machines that can be bought and sold rather than just restoring forests at a one-time cost. Under socialism, these solutions that I outlined and many others that are being discovered could be implemented on a comprehensive scale based on need rather than profit. Currently, all the industry giants are in control and even write the laws, from fossil fuels and nuclear to agribusiness and petrochemicals. They determine what is funded and implemented so they can continue to control the market and reap profits 
despite scientific evidence proving their methods are outdated and detrimental to humans and the planet. So how would socialism solve the crisis? Socialism is based on a planned economy rather than the chaos of the free market. The socialist government looks at what resources are available and what is needed by society and plans production to meet those needs in a sustainable way for the long term. Currently, the chaotic capitalist production cycle creates immense amounts of waste by creating things that aren't needed and aren't made to last. The recycling movement that became, began in the 70s was hijacked by the petrochemical industry. So they could keep making cheap disposable items and at the same time, diffuse the movement that was rightly concerned about waste. We are given the illusion that recycling makes a difference, but the majority of plastics aren't recycled because it's not econo economically beneficial to do so. Only 10% of plastics produced since the advent of recycling have ever been recycled which is why our air, water, and even rain and snow now contain microplastics. Under socialism, the people would have control and make the decisions on what is produced and what materials are used instead of it being determined by what is most profitable. The ecosystem is like a factory. When a cog in the factory is lost, production falters. And when too many cogs or species are lost, the entire factory breaks down. This is resulting in the sixth mass extinction that we are currently in the midst of. Under socialism, cities could be transformed into eco-cities, integrating them into the ecosystem. So instead of impeding biodiversity and adding heat to the atmosphere, they would help cool the climate and be home to an abundance of life. These eco-cities would have all resources needed for work, life, and recreation, all within biking and walking distance, and zero emission public transit would link communities. Suburban sprawl and the car culture that forces workers to commute long distances will be a thing of the past. This is not utopian. In a country like the US, which has an abundance of resources, this shift could happen very quickly under socialism. Socialism has shown a great capacity to overcome challenges that were seen as insurmountable under capitalism. For instance, in Cuba, within one year of the triumph of the revolution, illiteracy was overcome through a campaign to teach over 1 million Cubans how to read and write. In 2009, Cuba implemented an energy revolution and distributed energy efficient appliances to 100% of households and was the first to eliminate inefficient incandescent light bulbs nationwide. Under socialism, the resources and ingenuity of humanity can be utilized collectively for the benefit of everyone, rather than competing with each other to make profits for a few at the top. It is truly the only path out of the climate crisis and for the liberation of humanity. Every day, more and more people globally are seeking a renewed connection with each other and the planet and looking for another way forward. The pandemic has given us a pause to reflect on a new path and increasing numbers are looking to socialism. There is a future worth fighting for. And if we can envision that better world and come together to demand change, we can win. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina, for that wonderful talk. If you'd like to get your hands on Tina's book, please check out our online bookstore, which um, it will be linked in the chat. And here it is, it's an amazing book. I am one that is scared of science, but this book did such a great job. Tina did such a great job of explaining what we just heard right now and understanding the role of capitalism in planet destruction, but still having hope that socialism can lead us to answers and to a different future. Um, we're also excited to announce that the latest issue of Breaking the Chains, which is our women's magazine, is now available. Um, here I have the older issue, um, but it, the Breaking the Chains magazine is just a socialist perspective on women's liberation. The new issue focuses on specific struggles that women face in the U.S. prison system. So make sure to check out both of these issues and get your hands on them to learn more about um, how socialism can bring in a new future. Our final speaker tonight, before we go into a discussion, is Ji Yoon A. Ji Yoon uses she, they pronouns. 
is a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, as well as a leading local organizer for the La Riva 2020 campaign. Ji Yoon will be sharing with us why it is we need a revolutionary party. Welcome, Ji Yoon. Thank you, comrade. So the fire season in California is yet again wreaking havoc on people's lives and communities. The Trump administration has been ripping up one environmental protection after another. The Democratic Party leadership has done little in defense and Biden's climate plan is weak. It's easy to feel a sense of hopelessness as the world's leaders have not taken any real steps to halt carbon emissions and heal the planet. It's clear that the capitalist system and its puppets function against the needs and interest of the working class people and the planet. Whether it's a deadly pandemic or the climate crisis, we see the capitalist ruling class barreling steadfast with production that fits the profit motive and destroying everything in their path to fill the bottomless pockets of a few. In response, many of you might be thinking, this isn't right. We need to do something to change this. We need to act now to save humanity from the climate crisis. You might find that you can't ignore your instinct to fight back. That, my friends, is the seed that can bloom into revolutionary consciousness. Organized resistance and the development of a mass socialist movement with a revolutionary party is precisely how the working class can take power and save humanity from the climate crisis. The movement to defend the planet has exploded in the last few years. The incredible energy and organizing, particularly on the part of young people, is a powerful and necessary step in the right direction. However, we must not let the ruling class contain our organizing within the framework of the capitalist status quo, because the capitalist status quo is what is responsible for the reckless destruction of the planet. Let's talk about the Sunrise Movement, for example, which is a liberal environmental organization. Their primary strategy is to vote in politicians who reject fossil fuels and advocate for clean energy through strict laws and regulations. The problem is that as long as the capitalist class is in power, it'll be impossible to just pluck out the fossil fuel industry because that's what makes them the most money. I mean, just look around the room that you're sitting in and notice all the products, the furniture, the food, the car in your driveway, the lighting, the building itself. Nearly everything that we use is made with fossil fuels. The US dollar is inseparable from oil. The capitalists will not give it up that easily, no matter how much you appeal to their moral senses. Also, the Sunrise Movement's biggest funder is the Rockefeller Family Fund. But John D. Rockefeller built his wealth and fame on oil, on exploitation and capitalist profit. So there's obviously a conflict of interest, which is evident in many liberal and nonprofit organizations. The donors of these organizations become the puppeteers of mainstream activism. Comrades and friends, we cannot let the ruling class manipulate and limit our resistance to mere band-aid solutions that are palatable to the ruling class and their profit motive. We cannot solve the issue of climate change under the same ruling class that benefits from the system of unregulated and wasteful production that is solely based on the whims of the market rather than the needs of society and the earth. We must acknowledge that the climate crisis is a class struggle. The capitalist ruling class causes the most environmental damage. They're the ones that bomb global South countries into oblivion, poisoning ecosystems and causing cancer and birth defects. They're the ones that pollute the air and water of black and brown communities in the US. They're the ones that lay oil pipelines that ravage and pollute native communities. The working class and oppressed people all around the world 
bear the brunt of climate change. Yet the capitalists dare to blame climate change on the working class people for using plastic straws and driving cars. The climate crisis is a class struggle and it must be addressed as such. But you won't see mainstream climate movements centering the class struggle or anti-capitalism. In fact, they don't even mention the word capitalism. They vaguely blame it on human activity, but the climate crisis is not caused by everyone and not everyone has benefited from industrialization. In fact, the US military, which serves the ruling class, is the number one polluter in the world. They are a super consumer of fossil fuels to wage war on global South countries to steal their resources, including oil, which then they consume to wage even more war in a sick cycle solely for the ruling class profits. The Party for Socialism and Liberation recognizes that the only way to save humanity from the climate crisis is to overthrow capitalism through class struggle and replace it with socialism a system that works in the interests of the planet and humanity, a system where we produce only what we need, a system that works to actively eliminate emissions and waste, a system that limits the extraction of natural resources to what is sustainable in the long term, a system that is internationalist, where we all collaborate to nourish our one earth. But in order to maintain the system and the real climate solutions, the working class must be in power of the state apparatus and function through democratic and centralized planning. The question then is, how do we get there from where we are today? The answer is revolution. Revolution is necessary because the capitalist class won't just hand over the reins of control that have proved so profitable for them. You might be wondering, what will revolution even look like? When will it happen? The truth is, revolutions cannot be predicted. Revolutions throughout history did not unfold in the same way because the context and conditions of each revolution is different. But a common thread of successful revolutions to date is the existence of a revolutionary party. A revolutionary party, like the Party for Socialism and Liberation, learns the lessons of past movements and revolutions while being involved in the most critical struggles of the day, wherever there is class struggle and rebellion. Revolutionaries meet the working class people where they're at and help them channel their instinct to fight back into a larger movement, which is revolutionary socialism. The Party for Socialism and Liberation has stood shoulder to shoulder with you in the revolt against racist police terror, demands to cancel rent, as well as the climate marches last year led by our youth. These spontaneous outbursts against the system are necessary. Collective people power in the streets puts real pressure on the ruling class and it leads to reform more than voting ever could. But this cannot be the peak of our struggle because reforms can always be rolled back. Reforms to mitigate climate change can always be rolled back in the interest of the ruling class. You see the Trump administration repealing environmental protections. You see Democrats approving the $738 billion budget for the military, which is the biggest polluter in the world. That is why we must go beyond the isolated moments of resistance within the framework of capitalism and fight for socialism so that the working class can apply the climate solutions that Tina talked about earlier, much like how Cuba and China have been doing thanks to socialism. And how do we get there? A revolutionary party, such as the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Our party will help you grow as a revolutionary through study and action. We help you connect the dots from our individual struggles and larger societal issues to the totality of the capitalist system. We recognize that the issues like climate crisis, racism, and sexism are all linked struggles. They're all intertwined with the class struggle. We recognize that we can liberate the working class from oppression through revolutionary socialism. And we study this revolutionary theory and apply it into practice, sharpening our skills as revolutionaries 
so that we are prepared for revolution. And I want to end here by reiterating that the climate crisis is a symptom of a disease. That disease is capitalism. The only cure is revolutionary socialism. And we need revolution and a revolutionary party to get there. You are not alone in this fight. Join the Party for Socialism and Liberation today. Thank you. So now that we have listened to our three wonderful speakers, we have a little time now for comments and questions. You all are invited to speak if you'd like. Hello, uh, this is a question for Dr. Landis. Um, she talked about a lot of um, different solutions that are currently being enacted to help combat climate change. Uh, where are some good organizations to donate money or to volunteer with to work directly with those projects for reforestation and um, the, um, the marine permaculture projects? We have a question from Elise. How does the PSL feel about veganism to address climate change and human and animal rights violations? As far as the marine permaculture project, that's... Um it's based, um, I believe they're in Monterey. It's the Climate Foundation. Uh, the researcher is Brian von Herzen. Um, you can find more details in my book. Um, and then as far as reforestation, I don't know of any that's happening in California, honestly. Um, there are, are, There is like the Friends of the Urban Forest in San Francisco. They're like a greening, urban greening project. Um, so you can look into them, which, you know, Urban areas are a big problem for climate change because of the, the urban heat island effect. So the more we can green cities, the better. The point on veganism, industrial agriculture, industrial livestock raising is absolutely very cruel and very environmentally destructive. And, and you know, the PSL is definitely not for that. And like I outlined, there's other ways to, to raise livestock that are in line with... Um, ecosystem and, and, and humane. Since there weren't any other questions, I just want to add one point on the wildfires as well. Until the 1800s, Native American tribes in California had annually controlled burns uh, to get rid of the burn off the fuel in advance of wildfires. Um, and then when the colonizers in 1800s, they outlawed it basically. Um, so there is some work being done to return to those practices, but it needs to be greatly expanded. Another question would be, would nuclear power be viable under a communist government? Another question is, does it seem like the Green New Deal is a viable option to combat climate change while providing job opportunities for millions of people? Is the PSL in support of implementation of the Green New Deal? Are you aware of any regenerative agriculture trainings or courses? And lastly, can the third speaker talk more about how recycling is not enough for reducing climate change? Yeah, I can uh, answer that uh, latest question about um, how recycling is not enough for reducing climate change. Um, I don't know too much about the details, but um, I learned that, you know, the global north, the developed countries will actually like dump landfill and recycling processes all on developing global south countries and just like dump it all on them and like make them handle it. Um, and I'd say that like, um, even though, you know, that alone isn't enough to solve the issue of climate crisis, I think that we as individuals should do whatever is in our power to you know, um, not hurt the planet. Um, I don't think that we should, you know, reject like reforms for climate change or like individual consumption habits, even though the ruling class will, you know, blame it on individuals and their consumption habits. Like, I think that we should still um, do whatever's in our power to um, sort of mitigate that. Uh, but our, our end goal should be revolution because uh, socialism is what uh, we will actually bring about real climate solutions. And uh, I wanna add that I got most of my facts for my talk from Tina's book, um, which I believe was linked in the chat earlier, but 
y'all should definitely read that because it blew my mind and it's very informational. Thank you. Yeah, I want to touch on the issue of nuclear. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter so um, if it's a socialist government or a capitalist government, it's um, not a good way to go. Um, you know, even just the life cycle carbon emissions of a nuclear plant are third highest next to um, coal-fired scrub plants and um, natural gas. So it's not clean energy because of, you know, all it takes to build and run these reactors. Um, and I want to just read a, a, an excerpt from the book, my book, um, about nuclear. So the World Nuclear Association is promoting the construction of 1,000 new reactors by 2050. That's one new reactor every 12 days as a way to curb worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. If implemented, their $8.2 trillion scheme would only offset less than 10% of the carbon dioxide reductions needed. So it's really, you know, it's big industry wanting to make profits. But as you can see, even if we built <laughs> one reactor every 12 days globally, it would really reduce our footprint by 10%. Um, and, you know, there was Chernobyl and that was in the Soviet Union, um, which was a huge, huge disaster. I mean, it's just very, very risky way to produce energy. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, not to date myself too much, but I was five years old when Three Mile Island happened. And that was a big disaster. And the government lied about how much radiation people were exposed to, but it's really unsafe. And there's, you know, they're trying to put all the waste on Native American land. And there's really no way to contain it for the tens of thousands of years it needs to be contained um, to not pollute the environment. Um, Ocasio, um, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal, um, you know, there's a lot of great things in that, actually. But, you know, there's, in my opinion, there's no way it will ever get approved by Congress as it is because, um, you know, because big business is really part and parcel of our government. Like, you can't separate it. Yes, there is the, you know, the, the grouping of progressive Congress people at the moment, but um, overall, it is not progressive. Um, but it's good to fight for those demands. We absolutely should fight for those demands. Um, we should fight for a Green New Deal for jobs in, in um, you know, industries that actually help the planet and for a complete, you know, revolutionizing how we live. But like I said, it goes so much beyond just renewable energy. It's, it's really re- uprooting every way we live, honestly. I mean, how we build our cities, how we get around, like um, how we grow our food, it's all all intertwined and all um, necessary um, to solve the crisis. There's one question about China's Green Wall or Cuba's Green Revolution, just to discuss around it, if we had any thoughts about it, as well as um, what should be our concrete demands that we should make at the immediate moment. But I think you kind of covered that. A little bit. And if you are aware of any regenerative agriculture trainings or courses. Oh, I, 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 there probably are some in the Bay Area, I would think, because it's very um, progressive um, education out here. But I do know there are actually, ironically, in Pennsylvania, there's a regenerative agriculture farm that's been around since like the 50s. So there are, there are some around, around the country. We just have to look. Um, and, you know, some people use different terms for it. Some are biodynamic. Um, they call it biodynamic, natural farming. There's different um, terms for it. But basically, anything that, any type of farming that doesn't use any inputs, fertilizer, irrigation, um, because all those things, in the end, don't help build soil. And that's a big, a big problem um, we're facing right now. I did like want to make this comment and again thank you um for all the um all the presenters and speakers there were all three great talks and uh just to talk about the green new deal one and talking about China and Cuba it's that states socialist states like China and Cuba are implementing what you would could call a green new deal 
you know, it is like creating jobs. It is investing in the renewables and a better um, sort of uh, way of living. And as both Dr. Javi, Tina, and June said, um, it does take sort of like revolutionizing the way we live. And it really goes on like all all fronts. And it comes from just years and years and years of having, you know, of what happens after you have and maintain a revolution, which is what we see in China, in Cuba, and is the process that as a revolutionary party and as a revolutionary orga organization, we're learning for and uh, learning from and working for. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, all presenters. And if you wanted to add on like that, you know, feel free. Um, I want to thank uh, each of our presenters for sharing this important political analysis and call to action tonight. Thank you to everyone who attended and participated. Um, if you like what you heard today and want to hear and read more, head over to Liberation News for socialist analysis of current events and reporting from the front lines of struggle. And if you're interested in joining the PSL, go to pslweb.org org slash join to apply. If you have recently applied, we follow up with everyone and you will be hearing from us shortly. Don't forget to fill out the digital signup sheet being shared in the chat right now to participate in any of the exciting and important upcoming activities like the um, volunteering for the La Riva 2020 campaign, as well as the car caravan this Tuesday. So thank you all for joining tonight's event. We hope to see you in the streets or one of our virtual spaces soon. And buenas noches, good night. Thank you to everybody.